on this episode surprises i'm kind of i kind of surprised that it just works we are scrounging for tokens and you know that's uh, there's almost 10 tokens that we saved there uh. <laughs> as we slowly turn into some kind of robot technician OBD. Mm. Hi everybody, welcome to this beautiful tutorial. This is Christian and uh, this is the Lazy Devs Academy, the advanced shmup tutorial. We are making a co-shmup. Temporary name only. Don't get used to it. I mean, you will get used to it, but it's not going to be co-shmup. Co it's going to be something else. Um, we are about, we just integrated all of our prototypes into one big prototype. We are marching towards the Great Wall of Schmups. But for now, I want to do some optimization today and I want to add a state machine. Um, optimization, so we are now at 16,000 tokens. That's pretty good. We are not even a fourth way into uh, the game. We already have like some really cool basics, right? So that's kind of nice. I don't, I don't mind that too much, but it would be nice to create, as I already said before, um, kind of like a nice compact base, kind of like a core, simple core of our game that is really nice and polished and not in any way janky. Um, so, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about this. Um, doing major changes to the core of the game later on when we're already built on top of it might be difficult. So this might be a good moment to do a little bit of optimization. And generally, it's a bit of a, you know, problem. Premature optimization can be a big deal, a big problem. You're starting optimizing something that you might be changed later on and then you'd throw away a lot of work. So generally, we warn people against doing uh, premature optimization. But in this case, you know, we spent with these functions uh, uh, already quite some time, so it might be worthwhile doing a little bit of optimization now. Uh, and these are things that I already had in mind. For example, um, you know how I use a lot of arrays like this, you know? You know how I did that? It's And people were like, oh, Christian, you can just make this so much easier, you know, it's, you don't need those. For example, we have a but R table and a dear x and dear y table. We could have done this so much simpler. Um, I didn't do that um, because there is a very, very major trick in PQ8 that you can pull off, which is really nice, which is the split trick. And I, I'm not sure if I, I don't think I did that in the basic Schmuck tutorial. But yeah, there's a, a function called split. And that function takes a string. So let's say 1, 2, 3, 4. If you put a uh, string into the split function, what it returns is an array with one, two, three, four. It returns an array like this. Now the thing is this array is five tokens, but the split function is only three tokens. So this entire, you just save to tokens. It's because this is equivalent to this, and this is just so much more tokens. And what's more, if you add another token, like if you add another entry in this array, now it's six tokens. Now it's no longer f five tokens. If you add here an element to this array, it's still three tokens. It doesn't matter how many entries in this array we put. It's always going to be just three tokens. That's an incredible uh, token saving if we can put everything in those arrays, right? Uh, that's why I favorite solutions that you know, that that uh, that we're creating like these kind of like very simple arrays because that's something that you can really, really easy condense down into tokens. I'm already worried about the tokens. <laughs> but yeah, that's something I use a lot in my games and you should too. Um, there's maybe something that might be confusing, which is um, you, you can also put a text in here, for example, like hello, um, hello, comma, two and so forth. Um, that will return hello. Uh, it automatically detects kind of like the, I think it does that. It automatically detects uh, the entries in the string that are numbers and converts them automatically into numbers. That's something that Lua generally in Pico 8 does. It, when you have a string that contains a number that will, that can easily be converted into a number almost seamlessly, you don't even notice it, which can be sometimes very confusing. Uh, but yeah, you can con condense any kind of uh, array of any kind of value, when it's, when it, whatever it's a string or a number, 
you can convert that uh, in using the split function into just like a big string and a, you know compress the tokens that way. Okay, so let's apply this trick <laughs> just to see what kind of savings, token savings we're gonna get using this. Uh, let me remove this. Um, right, so we are now on 1,639 tokens and then we're gonna go split. And by the way, there's more things we can do with the split. For example, right now uh, the, the commas are separating the different entries in the array. Um, you can change that to something else. And also later on, we're going to write a, a more advanced split function, but let's just, let's just not get ahead of ourselves, okay? Let's just con con concentrate on making this work. La la la. Zoo. By the way, this is something we're going to tackle next. I don't like that either. But first, let us, let us do the split solution. Right. Um, also, the map sex here. Oh yeah, that's that's a good target for the split function. Oh yeah, look at this. Hoo -hoo -hoo. Um, there's more things. For example, this flame array here. Um, but you know what? I'm gonna get this flame array out. Um, I'm gonna because we have a different ship array here, right? So let's let us not make it local. Let's like make it global. Um, we're gonna ha probably have to do like a uh, uh, centralized animation solution. Let's let's write this in the to do already. Centralized animation system, because we're gonna have a lot of. We probably have a lot of um, um, arrays like this, which is just like a sequence of of sprites. And we want to maybe not always create a new variable for that. Every time, maybe we're just gonna have like a big array of animations and we're gonna get animations from that array or something. Um, but yeah, it's something that we're gonna think about later. Um, what else? What else? There's a lot of small arrays every now and then that we that pop up, uh, but you don't have to do it every time. Like for example here, right? There's a four entry array and it's like, I mean, it's five tokens. It could be less, right? Um, yeah, let's let's go. Let's circle back to that later on. I, we don't have to do it every time. We don't have to do it every time. Um, for now, the big ones, the global variables, are something that are easy targets for this. Okay, so now we are at. Like, first, let's see if this works. It doesn't. Ah, I is. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I was like, oh, what's, what's happening? Okay, it seems to be working. Explosions are working. Done. So we just saved a hundred tokens, <laughs> almost a hundred tokens, because we're now, now at 1,551. This is just like hundred tokens for free. Um, yeah, that's so. That's a good start. A good start indeed. Let us let us keep the history of our savings here. Um, right. Let us think about more things. Let us think about more things. As I said, I don't like. There's there's some things I don't like about the system here. Um, I don't like this thing that we have to add a zeroth entry to our but r. I don't like that. Uh, so I want to make the system so it's just like. I don't need this line because I hate this line. But also, and this is the part where you have to remember what we did here. See how we have this here? When we're moving the ship, that uh, we only move the ship if the direction is greater than zero, because if it's zero, then the ship is not moving. And in this case, uh, when the ship's not moving, you don't want to add anything to this. Wouldn't it be great if we could just get rid of that if statement? I mean, oh, sure, it's just five, it's five tokens, but it also simplifies the code a little bit, right? So, because essentially what we're doing, right? Essentially what we're doing, we're just adding something to the px and py value. And we could just as well, we could just as well add zero and that would be it, right? We just add zero. Um, so in this case, in our dear x and dear y, the first entry will be just zero. 
that will simplify things, right? So like just the first entry is just like not moving at all, zero, and then we can get rid of the this, that if statement. We're just gonna get the first entry from that, that dear x and dear y array, and that's gonna be zero, and we're gonna add zero to this thing, and then the ship's not gonna be moving. That seems, that seems like a cool solution. The problem now is that the default direction is gonna be one, so that's 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 already kind of like a weird thing. So now one means not moving. Um, so let's see, where is this? So I, I guess that's kind of like uh, where do we where do we set deer? Oh, okay. So we just get it from the from the butt R. Okay, sure. So now we have to shift every entry in the butt R by two. By one. Yeah, by one. But in addition, I also want to change the butt R in a different way. I also want to add a kind of like the zeroth entry as the entry number one. So we, we can save this, we can leave out this thing. We are doing a lot of modifications. Let us do first the plus one on everything. So um, this is gonna be two, three, one, four, six, Seven, four, f five, nine, eight, five, one, two, three, one. Okay, it's moving fine. It's nothing changed. It's fine. It's just it's just working. It's just working. I'm kind of I kind of surprised that it just works. Oh yeah, uh, we can just now leave this off. Can leave off this if statement and it just works. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, no, no this, this is good. This is good. Let's try this. Ooh. S apparently, dear X and dear Y, the it didn't work. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we want to set this, the default value, the zero value, we want to set that to one. Because again, not moving at all is supposed to be one. Okay, so now it works. See, now this works. And now another thing I want to do is this thing. I want this thing to be removed. I want the, that, the entry that was previously number zero that we spliced in with this line. I want to shift everything by one. So um, that entry becomes entry number one. So I can just put it here directly into the array definition because again, arrays in Lua start at one, not at zero. So we have to like have this work around here. So we add a one at the beginning, one comma. We can leave out this line. And now all we need to do here, down here, um, Cursex, this is movement, there we go. See, um, we're gonna do dear equals the uh, whatever we have to, yeah, yeah, here, here, btn and this plus one. Uh, what if we do it? I think this might be a order of operations problem. Yeah, now it works. Isn't it nice? Isn't it nice? Just yeah, saved a bunch of tokens here and there, made everything just a little bit more compact and simpler, you know, just like working with the arrays as they are without having to modify them, removing some if statements. And you know, that's, uh, that's almost 10 tokens that we saved there. Oh! <laughs> I know, not big token savings, but I, you know, give me some victories, give me some victories here. Um, yeah, let's let's mark this with a with a star. That's the, our animation arrays. We're gonna we're gonna fix them later on. Uh, by the way, also another thing I want to do is I want to uh, remove this clear screen. We're not gonna clear the screen anymore. That's something that we did as debug to see gaps between the um, between the uh, uh, like if you had a segment that created a gap, we want to see that there is a gap. Um, but now we're always gonna draw the map to the screen. And every single pixel will be covered by some segment of the map. So we can get away without a clear screen. And it's like differences. So th th this was 25. It's 2%. It's 2% of the CPU. We're going to save by just removing the clear screen. So that's also important. Okay, so now I want to get into a state machines. And we already did that in the basic schmap tutorial. So you already know what it is. Basically, a 
state machine is kind of like this idea that your program is doing different things depending on a variable. Um, or, yeah, you have some way of controlling, radically controlling, transforming what your program does, which totally makes sense for like menus or if your game goes into like, I don't know, game over and there's like a different different thing that happens, not just the raw gameplay. It's just a general game flow. Uh, is something that's controlled by uh, some kind of state machine. And we want to start implementing this. Um, so we don't gonna have just like one big draw function. Oh, the draw function will change depending on the state that the game is in. I think a good start for this always is to create a start game function. That's kind of, is gonna be like a function that will just start the game, reset the game. So here we're gonna have to think about all the things that need to be reset every time we start the game. Uh, I'm gonna take these things out. Uh, definitely scroll is gonna be something that needs to be reset. Uh, and the thing, the reason why I'm doing this also is that we don't want to duplicate this, right? We don't want to have duplicates here. We don't have to define, if we defined the scroll value, for example, here, we don't want to define it in, in it and then also in the start game function because the scroll value to some extent is not important for the start menu, I think. So let's just like, you know, let's just like define the variables only once when we actually need them, uh, need to define them. The last deer is definitely something we're gonna have to do in the start game function. Boss, definitely something we want to do in a start game function. And the map sex, see, the map sex is something that we want to do in init because we want to define this only once. The, but the map sec i, we're gonna put it to the scrolling stuff. Um, the curse sex, we definitely want to uh, put in here. And I'm grouping them a little by, um, you know, semantically, you know, by the things that belong together. Uh, particles is one of our big arrays. Right. And then also I want to put all this stuff. I want to put all this stuff into the init function. Feels a bit cleaner if it's in, if it's in init. Uh... I want to make sure that this is here. Then the ship sprite is something that we want to reset. Um, in these are like ship related stuff. Um, then the shots is our big. And let's put everything together. Let's put all of these together into our big arrays: shots, particles, shot weight, muzzle flash. Uh, right, so this is our start game. <clears throat> Everything is a little bit clearer here. Um, and then here at the end of the init function, because right now if you run this, nothing happens. <laughs> or we get an error because we haven't set up the game and the game already starts animating and then there's all sorts of very important things missing. Uh, so we're gonna just do a start game at the end of the init. We're gonna run the start game function and this, this starts the game, that's nice. Uh, now something we can uh, do just to test things out. Um, we're gonna put it on a button and we're gonna see if this resets properly. It doesn't. Oh, it doesn't because we're doing it in the middle of the update function. <laughs> So we set the game in the middle of the update function, and I think I think it it creates. Can we if we if we do a return? Does that work? Yeah, that now it works. So we quit the update function when we reset the game. So we're gonna get a fresh start on the update function. Yeah, yeah, it just resets. Good. Okay. Uh, we don't need to restart the game on the button. Don't I, I, bring me back the explosions. Good. So we have a start game now. Let us think about how we're going to deal with the states. Now, in the uh, basic Schmap tutorial, what we did is we had like a huge, big all if statement. And that's great, but now it's advanced Schmap tutorial, and I think we can use a different technique. There's, I've seen a lot of cool solutions for this. For example, something you can do, you can overwrite the update 60 fun function. You can just set it to a different function, right? So let's, let's just say something like function uh, my update up 
update. It's 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 a bit weird, but let's just let, let me just show you. CLS. We're gonna clear the screen with a green color, so it's like really clear. Uh, 11, right? We're gonna go CLS 11. This is my update. My update, right? We run this. It's not being called, right? Now we can do something like we can do something like here in the start git function. We're gonna do something like update 60 equals my update. We are dealing with function names, but we treat them as variables. We just assign to the name update 60, which is a function. We assign a different name, which is my update, which is my, another function. Because as I said, functions are kind of the same as variables, or you can save a function in a variable. A variable, a function name is actually the same thing as a variable name that contains a reference to a function instead of a value. Uh, so yeah, now we replaced our update 60 function with our green screen. I'm not sure why it draws the ship, to be perfectly honest. Oh, because it's the update function and it's not the draw function that we um, replaced. But yeah, so you can see we can replace functions and you can do a state machine like this, but I like to keep the original like a, a core draw and a core update functions around um, because there's some sometimes things I always want to do, no matter which mode the game is in. And then that gives me a place to put the thing that always happens regardless of the mode that the game is in. So um, what I like to do is to create two functions, two kind of like function names that are called in draw and update, and then switch in different functions into those names. So um, let's, let me create a function. Let's do this right here in, in, in the start game. Yeah, sure, start game is good. So when we start the game, we're gonna create a, a variable or a function name called upd update. And I'm gonna set this to um, upd game. And we're gonna set up a different name called drw and we're gonna call set it to drw game. Um, now these things don't exist yet, we're gonna create them, don't worry. Uh, but for now we're gonna, uh, the draw function, we're gonna, this, we're gonna drop everything out in a draw function, we're just gonna call uh, drw. Open, close, parentheses. This is, we're using this as a variable, so we don't have the parentheses. Uh, we're actually modifying the contents, the reference here. Um, and But here we are using the parentheses, or the, the parentheses, the, 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 the brackets. We're using the brackets here, and because here we're not manipulating the contents, we're actually calling that function, right? So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, right, so we have the draw function, and then here in the update function, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna just call UPD. UPD! <laughs> okay, so all that is left to do is create the UPD game and a DRW game. Uh, in the draw, uh, it's gonna be a draw game, so it's gonna be like, we're gonna create a new function called function, function, DRW game, open, close parentheses, close. And now we're gonna get all the stuff that was previously in a draw function, all this stuff. All this stuff until here. Be careful, it's easy to lose track. That's why you'd use indentations to kind of like see where things end and you know, where the function ends. And now we can put it in here. Um, and an end that is all the way at the left edge of the screen that always indicates the end of a function. Um, right, so this is our, everything that we have in draw function now in this dr 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 game, draw game. Now we do the same thing with update function. Get this out. Go here in update tab and we're gonna create function uh, UPD game. Uh, actually, yeah, that's good. Making sure that there's just one end at the end. And yeah, that's it. So now there's like a two step process here. When we draw the game, uh, there is a whole function that does nothing but call another function. Uh, that function is a drw function and we're gonna swap in different functions as drw depending on which mode uh, the game is in, just to specify. And it, nothing changed, nothing changed. But now something we can do, for example, is in adapted function, you see how we have the t here. 
that's something we can do globally now. So for example, in my update function, uh, in the update 60 here, we can advance the T, which is our counter of the frames. We can advance this in the global update function uh, because we want that always to happen no matter what mode we are in. Uh, this was just an example, we can remove that. Okay. And there might be other things as well. For example, here we could add a debug system, which I like to do, I did previously, and we're gonna maybe introduce one later on. Actually, let's put it in here to the to-do list because this is gonna be a really useful debug system. Right, so this costs us a little bit, but also like this first tab gets, it gets it's nice and, and clean now, and we got all the complexity into their own tabs and we can, go there and clean up later on. Right, so as I said in the doggy zone, one of the big challenges is I want to make a start screen. So I want to introduce, like right, right now we have one mode, so we don't know, it's not really a state machine, we're not actually switching modes. Now I want to actually switch modes between a start screen and you press a button and then you're in the game. So let us do that real quick. So now I don't want to start the game. What I instead want to do is I want to set up UPD and DRW to UPD, let's call this menu. Because I used to call it start, the start screen, but that was always a bit confusing because there's also start game and whatever. I'm just call it DRW menu and UPD menu. Uh, so we're gonna create functions for those. Uh, draw menu. And for now, we're gonna do a CLS2 here, just like an empty screen. And then UPD menu. Again, just an empty function for now. Uh, we're gonna think about what to do here later on. Right, let's run this. And now it starts as this screen, this is kind of our start screen. Now what we want to do is now, for example, is when we do go if btnp x, then if we press a button, then I want to start game, right? So now we start a game. It was a bit weird that, that you shoot immediately, but yeah, that's how it works. Uh, we're gonna deal with that later on. Uh, okay, so it, it does that because, you know, in the start game function at the end, we set, we set different functions to UPD and draw, and that's how we kind of like recreate our state machine. That's really nice because you don't have that big old if statement that we had in our basic Shmup tutorial. Now everything is solved with the UPD and your W. It's kind of like a bit weird because we don't really have a variable that says which state we are in. The state is just controlled by those two functions. So now let us make maybe the, the star screen a little bit more beautiful, huh? How about that? Instead of a CLS, we could do a map. Let's do a map. Let's just draw the map to the screen. Ta-da! So this just like draws a chunk of the map. Maybe we can we can put a nicer place of the map. Maybe, maybe, maybe this part here. This would be cool. 19 and 10. Let's try that. Map 19 and 10. Does that work? Yeah. Uh, maybe a bit higher, 19 and 8. Yeah, that's good. So it shows you the farm, uh, and maybe here we could, like later on the start screen, we could maybe show a logo. I don't know if we can manage a logo, but maybe we could show in like a cutscene of UFOs flying by and abducting cows to kind of like start the storytelling already at the, the start screen. Possible idea, I don't know. Let's see. Okay, and then later on we're gonna maybe add a menu, but for now we don't really have a menu, like we don't really have a use for the menu, there's no options that we want to do. We're gonna add a menu later on when there's actually something we want to do with the menu. Oh, by the way, something I noticed is that here in the update game function, now where we're moving things in the movement stuff, um, you see how we have dship spur equals zero here? We can get rid of that. We can just define the variable here at the very beginning where we set it to, um, you know, my sign of DRX. This is where we can create the gship spur variable uh, because previously we couldn't do that because that was an inside an if statement and sometimes we wouldn't run this code. But now we know that we always run this code anyway. So this is the first time when we actually use this variable. So that's where we can also declare it. Um, that's kind of nice here. Just making sure that this works. It absolutely does work, behaves 
flawlessly. Also, another thing I wanted to maybe do is maybe draw things. I, I'm drawing too much debug stuff here. I don't need that much debug stuff. Um, maybe I want to draw the scroll. That's always good to know. Um, but otherwise, I'm good, guys. I'm good on the debug stuff. And again, we might do another debug, our own debug functions later on. Okay, there's one last little tweak that I had on my list that I missed, and that is um, the explosions. You know, remember the explosions? Um, something that we did here, remember here, we had like three different grapes spawning on top of each other. And something that we did is on the second grape that we spawn, we move it a random number of pixels to the right, uh, to the left. Your right, your left. <laughs> And then on the final grape that we spawn, we remove it a random number of pixels to the other side. And that's cool, that looks good. Um, makes things a little bit, you know, uneven. Um, but it's always kind of predictable, right? When we run this, you always see that it always makes like the same cur curve. The curve is maybe less or more pronounced, but you know, there's always like the explosion that goes like this. And that's, that's okay. But we have tools now to uh, to uh, to make this a little bit more lively, more you know, less predictable, and uh, let's why don't we just use those tools so we can use the R and D range function, and, and and just plug it in here and like does it save, actually save tokens? This is five tokens. Uh, yeah, it does save even one token. Then then we have to do it. <laughs> um, Right, now, well, but now we're not gonna save any tokens because we want to do an EX um, minus five and EX plus five. Oops, so actually we're not gonna save tokens, but um, yeah, we're just gonna, just gonna look a little bit, a little bit less predictable. We have the same wiggliness of it, but the wiggliness is now really random. So it doesn't always make this, this loop, but sometimes it's just like, you know, it's just doing something else. Yeah, just making it a little bit more, more um, less predictable and utilizing more of our functions. Because the, here's the thing, and that's also something I'm gonna have to do at some point. We're gonna have to, at some point, go through the tools function and look at all of the places where we actually utilize the tools. Because sometimes you create a, like a universal function that you think you're gonna use a lot, but then you end up using it only one place. And in this case, you don't need the function. You just type in the code directly at that place that saves you, again, a bunch of tokens. Right, so let us just see if if we are if there's any little things that we can do. Uh, let's just yeah. Well, why, why don't we just do the debug system right now, and that that will sort sort that thing. Um, so let's see. I have a bit of a code. I'm gonna copy this over. We're gonna put this into the draw function, the actual draw function, not in the DRW, but we always want to do this. Um, <laughs> and I have to. <laughs> Explain a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, so um, we have a function that we haven't talked about, cursor four four, that sets the cursor of the of the text where you're going to print the next text or draw the next thing. And we're going to set that at coordinate four four. There's like a cursor in, internally. You don't see it, but there's like a text cursor that you could place somewhere on the screen. And then later on, when you print something, you don't have to specify. You know, I want to print something at these coordinates. It will just print at the cursor, right? That's how you can have like multiple print statements under each other, and then the text will appear uh, under the next text. The cursor automatically advances as you print things on the screen. So we're gonna set the cursor somewhere. We're gonna set, oh, we also didn't have this. You can set a default color that will be used when you don't specify a color. And we do all of these things, so then we can, um, loop through an array called debug and print all this just under each other on the screen without having to calculate the exact position of each line. We let Pico8 do the stuff. We're gonna specify just where it starts and what color we wanna use and just print all of the things under each other. Uh, this will also mean that we have to do a debug. Let me put debug, uh, yeah, in init, in it. why not, why not in it? We're gonna create this debug array. Um, 
And of course, uh, when we draw these things, I want to mark this as a star because at the end of the game, when we finish, we're gonna remove the system. We don't need a system. It's just like a little, little helper for us. So now something that we can do here is instead of printing the scroll, we can just say debug one equals scroll. You're just gonna set the first entry of this debug array to scroll. And now you can see that it's, you can actually see the scroll over there. Right, and so some, also something you can do is add things to debug. That's kind of nice whenever there's an event, you can add something to an e debug. <laughs> there's a frame. And actually, no, let's actually add it to our update function when we shoot. Shoot. So we can see if something was triggered, right? So now you can see you can see a new line is being added every time I shoot. So this is kind of like a really nice and flexible system to do debugging stuff. I always use it in most of my games. What is our token count? We are at oh, 15,081. I'm good, I'm good with that. 50,000 tokens is fine. It's not gonna be a problem at all. Let us move on to the doggy zone. That's right, the doggy zone. All right, so the doggy zone for this time around, I, you know, at this point, the doggy zone is always going to be the thing that's coming up in the next episode. And some of you already talked about this. It's time to tackle this problem, the problem of um, of sprite space. You see how how much sprite space we use we just for the for the ship. Just this is just the player's ship, and that's kind of like one almost one fourth of our sprite space. That's crazy. And I want to compress this because there's a lot of black space in here, right? And also a lot of people pointed out this ship is symmetrical. Not quite though. Not quite. It is almost symmetrical. Almost symmetrical. You see like the reflection in the, in the, in the cockpit, that is not symmetrical. But otherwise, a lot of about the ship is symmetrical. And also when you're banking left, that kind of looks very similar to when you're banking right. Again, not quite. It's not quite the same sprite just mirrored. There, again, the reflection is different, but it's close. So we can get rid of half of the sprites that we dedicated to just the ship sprite uh, by just like drawing half of it on the sprite sheet and just drawing a duplicate on the other side when we draw the ship. So that's nice. Uh, we have the similar thing with the, with the muzzle flash, which is also gigantic. This is just like, this is really just mirrored. So we can just draw half of the muzzle flash. Same thing with the bullets here. Those bullets could be just like half of that. And then we could save a whole bunch of sprite space. There's also some debris. This, we don't need this shot anymore. We can remove this. So we want to create a function, a system, I think would be even better that we can use to draw sprites in a mirrored way, to kind of like only draw, only have half of the sprite in our sprite sheet. Uh, but, uh, you know, the system will automatically draw the second half as well. But, and this is kind of like the challenge, this is the simple part. So if you can make a system that does that, that would be great. But the challenge is also to make the system capable of dealing with exceptions, like, you know, the cockpit reflection. If it would, it would be nice if the system automatically knew somehow that there is, uh, the, that it has to do something additional here to fix the reflection. And also, and that's the last challenge, the system needs to be easy to use for us. See, if, if when we're drawing things, it's kind of nice how when we, for example, drawing the, sh the ship, we just drawing a number, it's this SPR function and just a number. And that number just draws the ship sprite. So the system needs to be also as easy to use as the SPR function where just one number is associated with one sprite. I have a system in mind, I did some tweaking and tuning and I will show you on the next episode. But before I do, I want you to have a go at this problem. How do we create a system that draws mirrored sprites that is as easy to use as the SPR function. Keep also in mind that we might want to have bigger sprites, smaller sprites, we want to have a system that is flexible that can deal with all sorts of sizes of sprites.
Okay? Right, right, right. This is gonna be the end of this episode. And as always at the end of the episode, I say a big, big thank you to you, all the beautiful people out there who are supporting this show on coffee.com. This keeps the show afloat, makes this whole thing possible. Thank you so much for your support. Also wanted to read out some comments. Um, this is from Maxine Red on episode 10. Uh, they said, what I've learned, a contrast frame is more of what you see in a city explosion, I think Akira. It's a dark frame that is followed by an explosion frame. So it gives additional contrast to the explosion frame and makes it more pronounced. Yes, um, we haven't dove into the topic of contrast frames, but something that you can have in animation is you want to have a bright explosion, but your screen is already bright. Let's say you want to have a bright explosion in broad daylight. You already have a blue bright sky and there you want to, uh, an explosion to appear that flashes. Well, the difference between the bright blue sky and the pure white of the explosion is not going to be that great. Right? It's not going to feel as if it's a flash because it's kind of all two bright colors next to each other. It's not a huge contrast there. So what an explosion quite often does is, like in animation, what you quite often do is you insert one or two frames of pure black and then white on top. So then it looks like it flashes because you go from the bright blue sky to complete black to complete white again. So you get like flickering, a short flicker that feels more like a flash. So that is a contrast frame and explosions in uh, games do that often as well when they add uh, a little bit of a black color to the initial flash of the sprite. So again, it feels more like there's some contrast happening, there's some flickering happening. I don't think that thing that we saw in Akira, I'm gonna maybe show a frame here, that was quite what you call an, a contrast frame. I'm not sure if Maxine Rent means exactly this, but there is a dark dome at the beginning of the Akira explosion. Um, it, it looks like a contrast, that's something that you would do for a contrast frame, but in this case, it's it's, it's there for quite a long time, for like seconds, and that's not exactly what a contrast frame is. Contrast frame, you, you, you would have something that is like really brief for one or two frames, so it really flashes. Uh, we might maybe even add a contrast frame later on to the explosion. We can absolutely pull this off with our system. Um, might be worth trying out. And yes, at the end, a short reminder that you can support this show at coffee.com slash lazydevs and get access to new episodes earlier than they appear on YouTube. Right, right, right. So we are on the precipice of the next great system that will allow us to squeeze the game into the limited sprite sheet space of Pico 8. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.